Go ahead and settle down, settle down. All right, everybody ready? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord, we just thank you for just being who you are. We thank you for being the awesome God that we serve, Lord, and we're going to talk about that today. And Father, we thank you for your son Jesus and the cross and everything that that entails, Lord, and we thank you for saving our souls as we sit here today and we contemplate what it all means. And Father, I just ask you, Lord, to let your Holy Spirit speak to us tonight. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Help us, Lord, to understand what it means for us as a church. Help us to understand what it means for us as individuals, Lord. Help us to understand what it means as we walk out of these doors and how it applies to our lives. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, a couple of things I want to try to make this real for you. I mean, I'm really always trying to, to make Scripture real and understandable. And one of the ways that I want to do that tonight is uh, if you've been, unless you were in a cave or something, you know that Israel was attacked yesterday by Iran. Well, that has biblical implications or could, could very well be a strong indicator that the time is drawing much closer. Doesn't necessarily mean it is because Israel has always been persecuted, Okay. However, one of the things that makes me think it might be closer, if you go to Ezekiel, I think it's 38 and 39, there's a battle that takes place called the Battle of Gog and Magog. And what that is, is that's when another time when, in the future, when Israel comes under attack, many believe since the, that attack will happen when Israel has let their guard down, and you can tell they're not going to let their guard down anytime soon, so... Common wisdom says that that will be during the tribulation period because the tribulation period will begin when the Antichrist comes to power and he establishes a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. So that will be the time where Israel will think they're safe. Well, about that time, several nations effectively are going to gang up on Israel, and one of them is definitely Russia, and if I'm not mistaken, another one is Persia, which is Iran. And they're going to converge in... God is going to intervene himself, and he's going to defeat them. And they're going to be ba basically breaking down plowshares, uh, making plows out, out of their weapons for, for several years. Okay, now there's a lot of difference of opinion among scholars when that battle is going to take place, but it's clearly in Scripture. You probably need to look at it, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now the reason I said that, the reason that's so pertinent is because it doesn't take a lot to see that people already hated Israel. But now with Israel taking no prisoners the way they're taking no prisoners, you know, and I don't blame them. They're, they've been picked on long enough. They decided they're going to go after these guys. And now they're really upsetting the Arab world. And, you know, and remember now Russia and Iran and North Korea and China are all aligned, okay? So it's easy to see where they would all converge on Israel thinking they're just going to, you know, basically annihilate them. So that's all in Scripture. Now, the other thing to remember is during the tribulation period, the temple will be rebuilt, okay? Uh, there's been talk about rebuilding it, you know, for the last several years. The other thing is, you know, in 1948, just a couple years after World War II, Israel actually became a nation. They were a homeless people, effectively, for almost 2,000 years. Then, magically, they get their land back. God intervened, and through a few diplomatic... Uh, uh, razzle-dazzle after World War II in the United Nations, they recognized Israel as a nation. And the United States was the very first one to recognize them. I've said this many times, but it's, it bears repeating. And remember, when Abraham was called to be God's special chosen people, you know, God said, I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. Well, it's not, a, it's not lost on Americans. The reason we are so protective over Israel is the thing that does not get said a lot is because of that very word. You know, I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. We have been the best friend that Israel has ever had, and I pray that we continue. And if you, if you were asked me, we started becoming a true superpower right about the time we recognized Israel as a, a sovereign nation. 
okay, and became their best friend. So this is all intertwined in the, in the Bible. That's why Israel is such a big deal. Now think about it. I think Israel is about the size of New Jersey. It's not much bigger. But it's in the headlines every day. It has been for decades and decades and decades. What does that tell you? For a people that didn't even have a home for 2,000 years, that's how they wound up in Europe where they were persecuted by Hitler. They didn't even have a home, okay? So, you know, that tells you that God has had his hand on that nation and if you want to, you know, we should always, when we're talking about the end times, be paying attention to what's going on in Israel. And, uh, you know, in my lifetime, there's never been this much going on in Israel as it was yesterday. 200 ballistic missiles were fired at Israel. That's a big deal, okay? I don't know what's getting ready to happen. But, it, you know, it, it supports what I'm getting ready to say. You know, as I said each week that we've been talking about the seven existing churches of Asia Minor, if you're a true believer, you shouldn't be convicted once we leave this chapter. The rest of the way, if you're a true believer, you should not be convicted because you will be raptured. We're going to talk about that. You're going to be in heaven when this takes place. However, if there's ever a chapter that should convict us as believers, that should step on our toes, this is the one right here. Okay? This is the one that is warning almost directly to our church and every other church that exists today. Okay? And we'll get into that. Now, next week, the ball's really going to start rolling. We're really going to get into it. Basically, we're going to leave, a, leave the worldly realm we're in right now. And we're going to go to the heavenly realm in chapter 4. And it's going to get exciting. It's going to get really detailed. It's going to be fascinating, okay? Sometimes it's going to be depressing, but we've got a while before we get to the depressing part. But anyway, remember that Jesus told John in chapter 1, he said, write down what you see, what is, and what is to come. Well, this is what you see. He's write down the condition of these seven existing churches. And when he says these seven existing churches, he's talking effectively not only on their condition, but he's also speaking to the spiritual condition of all churches throughout time and especially today. That's the way we should understand that. Now, notice that he gives a brief description to each church of who he is, uh, describes part of his character. He commends those to have something to commend. He rebukes those who have something to rebuke. And he tells them all what they need to do to get themselves right for his second coming. Okay? Now, Ephesus, we know they took their eyes off Jesus. They lost their first love. The implication is they were a rigid church and they lost their love for believers as well in the community. Now, Smyrna did not have a rebuke, okay? He had nothing bad to say about that church. That was a persecuted church. But, you know, they remained faithful. So he had nothing but good things to say about Smyrna. And per, 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 say that again. Pernigam, Pernigam, anyway, they had accepted false teaching. They had allowed false teaching, to, you know, to infiltrate their, their church. And, you know, many of the believers were believing false doctrine especially sexual immorality, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, in uh, Thyatira, they had allowed a teacher, a lady, by, you know, that they referred to as Jezebel, probably not her name, but she was allowed to teach and allowed to influence, you know, these, their, their believers. So they basically, that was a corrupt church. Now, you know, today's church, what he's doing, remember the, the, one of the highlights that we need to pay attention to is each church he says, I know. He says, I know what you're going through. Now, sometimes when he says, I know, it means I know that you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Sometimes when he says, I know, he says, I know that you're being persecuted. I know you're having a tough go of it. But the bottom line is, we don't get to pull the wool over Jesus' eyes. He knows, okay, with those penetrating eyes. He says that to each church. He's basically warning us. You know, and he's trying to give us time. So in a way, he's being patient with us as he was with these churches. But he's also basically implying very strongly that there is a time where his patience will run out. Okay? So that's the thing we need to get there. Now, bottom line is, when you read these seven churches, these letters, there's no other way to interpret that as, other than, hey, as a believer, as a church, we need to be serious about what we're doing. Does anybody see any other way to interpret this? Okay? All right? Now, one of the biggest problems for us, and we'll revisit that, I'm talking about the modern-day American believer. Now, I'm not saying, you know, it seems like some of the churches overseas 
especially in Africa, you know, they got the Spirit of God in them, and they really take their faith serious. But in America, there tends to be a lot of apathy. But here seems to be one of the biggest problems that we have in the modern-day church is we want to add Jesus to our lives, and we don't want to put him first. Now, throughout the Bible, it is crystal clear that Jesus doesn't want to be second fiddle to anybody. He doesn't even want to be second fiddle to your parents. He doesn't even want to, you know, he says, you know, basically the Bible says, hate your mother and hate your father. That's not what he's really saying. He's saying, you should put me even above your parents. That's how much dedication you should have to me. And uh, one of the things, it seems to me that we missed that part. Now, he says, with him who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. As we go forward, these last three churches are probably the most important to listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling you. Now, I will say this. One of the things that I always go about, you know, Sunday I preached about patience. The fruit of the Spirit is patience. And I talked about how patient God is with us, and He is patient with us. And sometimes that can get confusing, right? Well, I think what I'm trying to say, I, I got a little analogy. You know, I know we got a few teachers in here. And so raise your hand if you're a teacher, have been a teacher. Okay. All right. Let me ask you a question. If you have a student that gives you absolutely everything they have, and they still come up short, and they're still at best, despite their very best effort, they're a C student, you're still pleased with that student, aren't you? If you know that student's given you everything that they've got, they've given you their absolute best effort, and the best that they could ever do is they're a C student, you're still happy with them, right? You know they gave their best. Now, when that student does not give his best, you're not so understanding, are you? Are you? Okay. Well, I love to tell you, you know, and I say it over and over, God doesn't have a problem that you struggle with sin. God has a problem when you don't put up a struggle with sin. Okay. So if you were to use the analogy of a student, we are sinners, you know. We're sinners saved by grace, and that means you're going to stumble. Despite your very best effort, you're going to fail him, you know, routinely on a regular basis. But if you're giving him your best effort, that's all he requires. He understands that you're going to struggle. What he has a problem with and what is going to be crystal clear to us as we get into this lesson is he has a problem when you don't put up a struggle. In other words, when you give him a lick and a promise. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get to. Now, you know, I think Paul was it said in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, if I'm not mistaken, it said, I fought the good fight, I finished the race. Underline that fought the good fight. You know, the Christian life, and many times when we're struggling with sin, it's a struggle. You're in a battle. You're in a spiritual battle. But the question is not did you live a perfect life because that's not possible. The question is did you put up a good fight? Okay, that's what Jesus wants to know. Now look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church of Sardis, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Now, you might as well say this is one of two churches that Jesus had nothing good to say about. Okay? Because I don't see anything good right there. That you know, Some people think that you're a good church and you're a lively church and you're doing all the right things. But he's effectively saying, I know better, you're dead. Okay? Now he says, I hold the pastors and hold the seven spirits, which is the Holy Spirit. You know, he's saying that. Now he says the Holy Spirit because they're dead because they're not allowing the Holy Spirit to move in their church. Now we've seen that sort of thing. Have you ever been in a church? that you did not even remotely feel the presence of the Holy Spirit? You know, you felt that cold feeling when you walked in the door and you know something's not right? Or have you ever been in your church, maybe this church, when, you know, it's not where it needs to be? Maybe there's dissension going on and people are arguing and we're just not where we need to be. And you walk in, you get that cold feeling even then, you know? That's what happens when you don't let the Holy Spirit do his thing and you don't respond and let him have control of the congregation. Now, that's evidently what this group was doing, but evidently, they looked effective. They probably were a very busy church. They might even have been doing good things in the community because they had a reputation of being a happening church. You know, they, they had it going on, okay? But remember, Jesus and what he said, we talked about this last week. It doesn't matter so much what we think of our church, and that's what worries me. I think we've got a great church, and I pray that you do too. And I, but most importantly is I want Jesus to think that we got a church, we got a church that pleases him. 
because that's the most important thing. Now, this is a good example of that. This church, people thought this church had it going on. They were probably pleased with themselves, but they did not please Jesus, right? Okay, that's clear. Now, look over here at Matthew 23, verse 27. Woe to you, teachers of the law of Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way... On the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Now, he's talking about the religious elite. So we know that in Jesus' day, that was a thing that was going on. You know, they had people, the religious elite, the Pharisees, teachers of the law, they were strutting around, and they were playing the role of these very, very spiritual people. Now, you know, have you ever heard the phrase spiritual elitism? You know, where people are spiritually, they, they put on like they're spiritually above everybody else. You know, that's a very dangerous game to play. You know why I like our church and, you know, the brand of Christianity that I think is important to practice? That's the real brand. You know, I'm a real person doing the best I can to walk with the Lord. That's the way to practice your faith. When you try to put on airs and act like you're somebody that you're not, you might fool a lot of people, but you're not going to fool the Lord, okay, which is the most important part. That's what I get out of that. Now, if you look in, uh, you know, basically, in many scholars say that this church at one time had been a happening church, had been a real spiritual church. But, you know, they were basically a monument rather than a movement at this point. Now, they needed the Holy Spirit to infuse life in them. They, you know, they had not been persecuted. You know why they hadn't been persecuted? Notice the rest of the churches, most of them were persecuted. This was not persecuted because they were no threat. They were having no effect in the community, you know. Now, let me ask you something. You know, if you were to look across, you know, in today's landscape, what would you say the symptoms of a dead church would be? Spiritually dead church. No growth, no growth might very well be a, a, a symptom. How about no love and no affection for each other? How about no power? Don't see the Holy Spirit moving and changing lives, right? No changed lives. How about apathy? That's the one I'm looking for. Church as usual. Church as usual. People just don't care. Apathy. You know, that's the biggest threat that we have. And we're going to talk about that at the end of this lesson. Apathy. <laughs> just walk in and don't care. You know, God wants us to be invested in his kingdom, and that definitely means being invested in his church, Okay. Now, just showing up and occupying space, you know, that would pretty much describe a dead church. Now, Revelation 3, verse 2 says, Wake up, strengthen what remains is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Effectively, he says, hey, you've fallen short. You're not who you should be. You need to get back to basics. You need to get in the Word of God, and you need to remember to listen and allow the Holy Spirit to do a work in your heart, okay? Basically, you need to obey. You need to be in heartfelt worship. You need to repent. Now, one of my favorite sayings, and I'm sorry for people like Jimmy and Sylvia that have seen me say it for 17 years, is spiritual audit. I love to say that we need to do a spiritual audit every once in a while. When I say you need to do a spiritual audit, what am I saying? You need to take a look within yourself and, say, and be honest with yourself and say, look, am I where I need to be? And you need to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And then if he speaks to you, you need to respond. Okay? I think you need to do that on a regular basis. I think people get in trouble when they don't look within and they allow their spiritual life to get away from them. And, you know, and then, and then they got a lot of work to do. If you do a spiritual audit on a regular basis, God, you know, if, you, if you're asking God to help you keep from getting, you know, out of control and continue to be in his will, he's going to help you. He's going to be where you need to be. Would you agree? All right. Well, the word of God, especially, you know, this chapter will help, will help you do a spiritual audit. I will tell you that. Now... Basically, when he says that I will come like a thief and you will not know what time I come, he's not talking about the second coming here. He's talking about judgment on this particular church. 
He's basically, and what I see there is this church is in danger of dying, and I see that he's getting ready to close the doors on this church. Now, that should really speak. There's church in this, churches in this area that that has happened to, and we've seen it. You know, I, I don't like bringing up other churches. That's not the point. The point is churches do die. Their, their doors do close, okay? And in today and age, the day and age that we live in, you know, is happening more frequently than ever. I forgot the statistics, but it's a thing, and it's going to be a thing. Anybody got any thoughts on that? Don't want to be a dead church. Okay, verse 4 says, Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, basically, just like the other church, there's a remnant here. There's a remnant of people who are faithful. When they say soiled clothes, they've not, you know, they've not taken on a sinful lifestyle. And that doesn't mean they're perfect, but they, they've, tried to, they've tried to pursue holiness, okay? they tried to walk with the Lord. Now, once again, when he uses the term, he who overcomes, he's not saying that, you know, you guys that are really strong, that can endure a lot, you're going to be all right, and none of the rest of you will. He's effectively saying he who overcomes is a true believer to begin with, okay? Now, when he says dressed in white, that's purity. That's righteous clothes. Now, look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Now, this is when the church comes back with Jesus. I saw in heaven, standing open, there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself, something we're seeing a lot of. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. The armies of heaven is the church. The glorified body of Christ is coming back with him. We have been glorified. We have stood before the bema seat and received our rewards. We're glorified and been rewarded. That's what he's talking about with his white clothes, fine linen. Now, when he says your name will not be blotted out of the book of life, he's not threatening, you know, to blot, you know, take people's names out of the book of life. He's basically saying that if your name is in the book of life, your salvation is secure. Okay, it's affirming more than threatening. That's what he's saying. Now, when you look at this church, what does the Spirit say to the churches? What does the Spirit say to you about this particular church? When you think of a dead church, when you think of uh, the church that this is described, do you have a picture in your mind of what that looked like? All right. Beg pardon? Faith. Play in church. Play in church. Yeah. You ever heard the term playing church? You know, if we're not careful, we can all fall into the trap of playing church. Because, you know, let's just put it this way. Churches have people in it. And churches have positions in it. Okay? And, you know, sometimes the positions are higher and, you know, and more, you know, uh, get more attention, singing, deacons, Sunday school teachers and whatnot. And if you get caught up in all that and forget where that power source is, you can let pride sneak in, and that happens a lot. And then the next thing you know, the Holy Spirit's not a part of what you're doing. It's all about your pride. You see what I'm saying? That happens to a lot of churches. I really and truly don't think it's happened to this. We've got some humble servants at this church, but we need to stay humble. You, you see what I'm saying? Or we can lose sight and get our eyes off the ball. Now, It's implying that he will not, you know, if your name is in the book of life, then your salvation is secure. It, it it's implying that your name could be good. Yeah, well, that's what I just addressed. It's not, though. And he's, he's saying it, it's more of an affirmation. You know, he's, if your name is in the book of life and he takes it out, 
then you're losing your salvation. Okay? In the Bible, Scripture interprets Scripture, and it, it, we can't lose our salvation. Right. I got an interpretation of that. Uh-oh. It's like uh, we would we put it in a sense of day, people on the roll of the church. People in that day that had the church roll. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Bible scholars feel like that what he was saying mm -hmm. was yep. there will be a time when those who are members of the church, but they're not Christians, they're mm -hmm. not followers That's of That's right. So their names will be. Omitted. That's a good interpretation. It's like, inter it's like uh, churches go back and, and throw out members that are and not the, attending. They, they purge their roles. They purge their roles. Mm -hmm. what, That's right. What this is saying. It's not that you, if you are a Christian, you're, you're saved forever. But there's coming a time when he will separate those the sheep from the goats. Pretend to be, uh, and they can be church goers and church going, but they don't have. Like we say a lot, you know, going to a church doesn't make you uh, a Christian anymore than going to McDonald's makes you a French fry. You, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right. Good, good interpretation. Revelation 3, 7. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of, of him who is holy and true, he who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, when he says holy and true, he's basically identifying himself as God. Jesus is God, okay? He says the keys to David, some people interpret that as the doors to eternity, the power to open the doors. If you look at Isaiah 22, verse 22, this is exactly where he gets it from. So I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David that is open, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Now, this is referred to by many scholars as the open door church. Now, like I said, some believe that open door is speaking to an admission to the kingdoms, to the kingdom. Others believe that open door represents an open door as an opportunity to ministry. And they walked through it. So they were obedient and pleasing to God. Now notice that he says they have little strength. You know, that implies that they're small in number. You know, now we see churches that are little in strength all the time. We see churches that have limited resources, but they're big in heart. Now this church was little, limited in resources, but they were big in heart. They were faithful in what they did have. Now, this is another church, along with Smyrna. He has absolutely no rebuke for the Church of Philadelphia. He has nothing bad to say that this church, they were doing what they could, they were doing the best they could, and they were pleasing him with their efforts. Remember I said that student, okay, you know, the student that gives his best effort, he might be a C student. Well, this wouldn't be a mega church here today. This would be, I'm thinking, a church probably about our size. And, you know, relatively speaking to the other churches, but this is a church that's actually doing the very best they can and hitting on all the cylinders with the resources that they, they give it. You, know, you see what I'm saying? We don't have 700 members, we don't have 1,000 members, and we don't have 10,000 members. But if we're doing everything he requires of us to do, then and we're doing ministry and we're walking through the doors that he's opening, think about Hope Station, think about Nursing Home, think about Yard Ministry, think about all these other ministries that we got, that would represent walking through the doors that he's opened for us. And we're going, you know, if he opens more, we're going to walk through them. Then you would be lining up as a church similar to the Church of Philadelphia. He would be pleased with that. Now, let me note something. A large church is a good thing. Now, first of all, I don't beat up on large churches. You know, uh, if God sent a thousand people to Grace Baptist Church, you know what we do? We'd open the doors and we'd build a building and we'd receive them and try to do the best we could, okay? But with that said, a large church is not necessarily a healthy church, okay? There's a difference between a healthy church and a large church. Now, many times large churches are healthy. I'm not saying they're not, but it's not necessarily a healthy church. Faithfulness is what makes a healthy church. If you're doing the best with what he's given you, that's the same thing as a Christian. You know, he doesn't expect me to be Billy Graham because he knows he didn't give me what I need to be Billy Graham. You see what I'm saying? He expects me to be Steve Strickland. 
And if I'm being the best little small church pastor I can be as Steve Strickland, then I'm being faithful, right? Same thing with you and your ministry. You know, he doesn't expect you, if he didn't gift you to be a Sunday school teacher, he doesn't expect you to be a Sunday school teacher. You know, if he, but whatever he got you doing, if you're doing it to the best of your ability, you're being faithful, and he's pleased with you. Same thing with churches. Do y'all, y'all see what I'm going with? This church is the, this church is the, the one that Grace Baptist Church has the greatest chance to be like, okay? I would like to say we're very close, but I mean, you know, I dare, I dare not say that. That's for Jesus to say. We're going to continue to strive. But, you know, this is the church that we have the greatest opportunity to be like. Would y'all agree with that? This is the one we should strive to be like. Would y'all agree with that? Okay. Now, we'll get to the more, uh, more serious questions there at the end. It says in verse 9, I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Now, as is the case with a lot of these churches, the Jews of the local community, they were persecuting Christians. They were telling lies about them. Well, Jesus is saying they claim to be God's people, but they're not. They rejected his son, remember. And effectively, when I hear this, I think to myself, you know, uh, in Philippians it says, Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. One day they're going to recognize that that church belonged to the Lord and they did not. Now, here's one that's really interesting. Revelation 3.10. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Now, that is one of the more significant verses in the Bible that speak to the rapture of the church. What he is clearly saying is, I'm not going to let you go through the tribulation period. Now, that's not just a promise to this church. That's a promise to all churches, all Christians who belong to him. Okay? If you've accepted Christ, you're a true believer, he's going to come for us before the tribulation period. That's called the rapture of the church. Now, here's the signature passage, the most commonly used one in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, but there are more, and we will revisit this. It says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up in, together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. And here's the part I like. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. That's what we need. That's why we need to remember. You know, and I'm going to encourage you with these words throughout this study because things are going to get dark when we get into chapter 6 to chapter 19. But, you know, remember, if you belong to the Lord, you are going to be with him, and this is one of the prominent verses as well as Revelation 3.10. It really speaks. He's telling that church, says, you're my bride. I'm not going to put you through suffering. I'm not going to put you through the tribulation period. Now, it just takes a little common sense to think, why in the world would the Lord allow his people, who he loves so dearly, the bride of Christ, to go through the seven-year tribulation period? Everything points to the rapture church, along with all the scripture that I'm going to share with you. We're going to revisit another one in chapter 4, the very first verse of chapter 4 when we turn the page next week. You know, I looked up there and I, uh, I saw a door open in heaven. He said, come up here and let me show you what must, must take place. So many believe that that's symbolic of the rapture of the church. And here's the thing, getting ahead, we'll revisit this again next week. One of the things that speaks to me more than anything about the church not going through the tribulation period, look how many times we mentioned churches at the first three chapters. Well, in chapter 4, you don't hear the church mentioned or referenced again until it comes back in that verse that I just shared with you in chapter 19. Church is gone. It's offline. So where did the church go? The church is in heaven. Okay? So we should be greatly encouraged and comforted by that. Now notice the trumpet call of God. Now you may remember a few weeks ago when I told you that is significant. You see a lot of that. The trumpet call of God, especially when it pertains to the rapture. Now, like I said, we're going to revisit this some more in the next chapter. In verse 11, he says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. 
Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Effectively, he's saying, hold on, stay faithful. When he says overcomes, we know that, that means a true believer. And when he says pillar, he's basically talking about you will be a permanent fixture in heaven. You know, in the name of my God, that's basically indicates ownership. Basically, God's claiming you. You're his children. And, you know, belonging to Jesus, belonging to God. And then, you know, we're talking about heaven. We're talking about your permanent home. Now, what does the Spirit say to the churches? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you about this particular church? Do you agree that this is the church of all the seven churches that we should strive to emulate? Okay. Are you comforted by the fact that this is not a mega church? That this is not a great big monster church that's just eating up all the little churches? It's just a regular church? Are you comforted by that? I'm comforted by that. You know, what's the, what's the object of the game? You know, it's not a game, but what is, the, what is the goal? The goal is to please God, be faithful to what he's given you. It's not necessarily to set the world on fire and be the biggest church in town. Sure, if you're doing the right things, that would be great. But, you know, that is not the goal. That's a human mentality that we have. You, you follow what I'm saying? Okay, and once again, I'm not beating up on big churches. You know, we would do the same thing. And, and you know, I like to say that they're doing something right. You know, they're growing. But anyway, uh, not necessarily a healthy church. Basically, what the Spirit says to me is get out the doors. Get outside the walls. Get out in the community. You know, influence the community for Jesus. Try to reach the lost. Try to make a difference. When he says open door, that's what I get from that. What do y'all get? Now, we're going to talk about that country club for saints here in a minute. Look at verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, this of all churches speaks to the church in America today. Now, basically, Jesus says he's the faithful one. Well, this church is not faithful. It had nothing at all good to say to the church at Laodicea. Now, here's the part that gets a little tricky. The water in Laodicea was undrinkable. They had to get their water piped in. They got their cold water piped in from Colossae. They got their hot water piped in from Heropolis. But by the time either one arrived in Laodicea, it was lukewarm. So they would have known what he was talking about. Now, basically, the, the hot water had therapeutic value, but it had no value at all by the time it got to Laodicea. And the cold water was not refreshingly cold. It was lukewarm by the time it got to Laodicea. Basically, he's saying, you made me sick. You made me sick. You had no value to me. You were not useful to me at all. Now, think about that. Now, how many churches do you, have you been to, let's say, that really didn't seem to be doing nothing for the Lord other than meeting? There's a lot of them out there. It's easy to happen. What if they effectively, they are, they're a club. You know, Jesus didn't call us to be a club. Now, granted, we love being around each other, and there's nothing wrong with loving to be around each other. As a matter of fact, a lot of things are right with loving to be around each other, but that's not all there is. You know, all this, the, the private secular clubs throughout Wilson, they love being around each other. They get together, and they cook, and they do fundraisers and whatnot, and I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying they, could, they do that. You know, the thing that bonds us is we're on mission for the Lord. You see what I'm saying? And if you're not on mission for the Lord, you are a country club. Does that resonate with anybody? Come on, somebody jump in there. That's right, that's right. We're more than a club. <laughs> you were holding that in, weren't you, Kay? 
Anybody else want to preach? I'm all for it. Well, it says in verse 17, you say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now, the city was wealthy. So was the church. They had plenty of money. But evidently, they had a false security. They thought they were blessed, which was a common thing, you know, back in Jesus' day, that if you had material wealth, that meant you were blessed, okay? You were doing something right. You were highly favored, okay? Which, you know, we know not to be the case necessarily. They were measured by human standards. Effectively, this paints a picture of a church that today would have a big building, would have a big bank account, but effectively they had no heart for Jesus. Now, they may have liked being around each other, but at the end of the day, it paints a picture that they were a big, proud church, okay? But they were devoid of the Spirit. Now, note that they had the wrong idea about themselves. Now, remember we were talking about that. We were talking about what Jesus thinks of us being the most important thing. Now, if you not if you recall, if I'm not mistaken, the church at Smyrna, you know, was was poor, but he says you you're poor, but yet you're rich. So they had been storing treasures in heaven. So Jesus thought of them as spiritually rich, but this church thought that they were rich, you know. But obviously they had the wrong idea about themselves. They were going through the motions, so they were spiritually poor. Is what Jesus was saying. They were pitiful, poor blind and naked now that goes back to what i'm saying you know when you need to you need to ask the lord and care about what he thinks of us more than what we think of ourselves because this is a great example this the church evidently thought well of themselves do you see is that the picture you're getting painted here now i remember talking about the biggest problem this church had is Michael Combs, the Christian singer that goes around, you know, we've been to several of his concerts over the years. Last time I went, he's, he puts on a great show. He uh, singles out and he picks on Baptists. And basically, you know, uh, if the Baptists don't move, you know, he, he's basically, he, he cracks on him and says, you know, oh, you one of them that got a little bit of Jesus. Okay, you kind of, you got a little bit saved, you know, you see what I'm saying? He's basically making a joke, but he's making a larger point, you know, that, you know, how do you get a little bit of Jesus? How do you get a little bit of saved? You know, not all the way saved, just a little bit saved. You, you see what I'm getting at? You know, not enough to make a difference. Check the box about going to heaven, you know, you know putting nothing in your spiritual retirement account. Now, I love to use that term. That's my favorite term the last couple of years. Do y'all know what I'm saying when I say contributing to your spiritual retirement account? Storing up treasures in heaven, doing the things that please the Lord, you know, just accumulating up there, just going, you know, he's going to pull them out and reward you accordingly. You know, this church, evidently, they were spending all their energy in, in material wealth. It, that's what it looks like. Would you all agree? All right. Now, here's a question. Would you marry someone who told you up front that they were going to give you the bare minimum effort? make the bare minimum commitment to you. Would you marry them? They might have done it when they got married, but did they tell you that they were going to do it and you knew it? Would you have married them? Nobody in their right mind would marry somebody that told you up front, I'm only going to give you a little bit of commitment. You know, I'm not going to give you my whole heart. You know, well, you know, that's, that's called, that's right, that's called a half-hearted effort. Who in their right mind? Well, you wouldn't do that in your marriage. Why would you do it with your God? Okay, think about that. Anybody got any comments about that? Now, this church was half-hearted. This church was lukewarm. This church was a lick and a promise church. And, you know, this is the one that made Jesus sick. Now, if you look at verse 18, it says, I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in fire, so you can become rich, 
and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and sad to put on your eyes so you can see. Now, when I see refined gold and fire, I see, you know, him saying a little bit of suffering would have done this church good, okay? Uh, you know, and think about that. Sometimes it takes difficult times to get us where we need to be in our relationship with the Lord. That's a tool that he has, you know. And he says rich, you know, he's talking about spiritual riches. He's talking about those treasures in heaven. He says white clothes, he's talking about righteous clothes, you know, to cover that spiritual nakedness. When he's saying sad, that was a, I salve was a product that was in the city. So he's speaking in terms they can understand. He's basically saying get some salve so you can see what you need to see and so you can open up and have spiritual eyes, okay? Now, basically Jesus demands them to put him first in their lives. That's what he's getting at. Now, this is the one that really steps on a lot of toes. Now, in verse 19, those who I love, I rebuke and discipline, to, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Jesus is effectively saying, hey, you can still make this right. You can still make this right. I'm, you know, I am rebuking you out of love. I'm rebuking you because I want you to get it. I want you to come to me. I want you to get yourself right. I want you to spend eternity with me. You see what I'm saying? Now, desire to get you where you need to be. He says, I'm knocking. You know, the question is, they had not listened at this point in time. They had locked him out, and they, you know, so they, they needed to let him in. Now, in Revelation 21, 3.21, says, To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, that's a figurative expression for we will reign with him in eternity. Now, remember that the church is comprised of individuals. It's comprised of people, like Michael said. It's a body of believers. It's not a building. Now, let's ask this question. Now, I want you to comment and be honest. As a whole, as our church, you know, what kind of letter do you think we would give? Because that's the question that begs to be answered from a corporate standpoint. What kind of letter do you think Jesus would write Grace Baptist Church? Well, we would like to hope so, but we need to be honest with ourselves, right? Big part. Okay, that, that's an honest answer. I appreciate that. Anybody else? What kind of letter would you get as an individual? Now, that's really the penetrating question for each and every one of us. What kind of letter would he write you as an individual? And only he and you can answer that. And I don't really think you ought to confess right here. I don't, I don't have the right collar on. That's right, that's right. I guess what I want you to do is walk away here and inter internalize these questions. Uh, you know, think about it as you leave and dwell on it, and if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, then, you know, you need to make the adjustments you need to make. That's the whole point of these letters. Jesus is saying, hey, you guys are doing good. Keep doing what you're doing. Most of them, he says, hey, you guys are doing good in this area, but you're not doing good in this area. You need to make these corrections. But with the church of Laodicea, he's basically saying, guys, you ain't doing anything worth a hoot, okay? He says, are you doing it for, are you doing it for yourself or are you doing it for the glory of God? That's right. And a lot of questions. Now, here's another interesting question. I want you to think about this. Remember I said that he's writing these churches, these existing churches. He does not write a letter to, to the long range of Christians out there. You know, he doesn't say to you guys don't belong to a church. You know, he doesn't even consider that. What does that say to you? 
that says to me, if you are a believer and you have no intention of being a part of a body of believers, then you might not be where you think you are. I don't see any other way to say that. You see what I'm saying? Because, you know, there's a whole, we know there's a whole other group of people in the world that basically claim to be Christian, but just like a baseball player, they never go to the ballpark, they don't own a bat, they never throw a baseball. How do they claim to be a baseball player? You see what I'm saying? They need to hear this. And, you know, because they get a chance to make a correction, a big correction right now. Would you all agree? Uh, we can deceive ourselves and get ourselves in a lot of trouble. Uh, anybody got any other thoughts? I told you it was convicting. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're probably right. That's right. That's right. And on the other side of what you think, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm just saying everybody needs, needs that church family, you know, to make it. I mean, you just say it's time to be encouraging mm -hmm. one to another. Absolutely. Like and, you said before, Steve, though, um, whenever these people were talking about why they left church and everything, and then they said that, um, that little analogy where the pastor went back and knocked on the door and said, why did you leave church? Oh, so-and-so mm -hmm. hurt my feelings. Did God hurt your feelings? Did Jesus hurt your feelings? That's right. That's right. Larry said that. Yeah, they're going, they're going to church for the wrong reason. Well, let me say this. That also puts an exclamation point on how important it is that we always be the church that pleases him and be the kind of church that people would want to come to and that he would want to send people to, you know, because it's very important because you can push some, you can literally by having a bad attitude, push somebody completely out of heaven. And then now I'm not talking about losing your salvation. You know, you know, these people may, you know, you may be the only Jesus they ever see, and they have a very bad experience. You know, then they don't come back. That's that's an awful lot to be responsible for. You see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, I don't want that on my resume. Yeah. All right, brother. I think one of the things we need to be aware of in the church of Philadelphia talks about Jesus holds the keys of David, meaning that he is the judge. Right. He he shuts the doors, he, he opens the doors. And he was warning the church of Philadelphia, look, if you stay like you're going and, and moving and, and steering off, then I'll open the doors of opportunity. If you don't, then I will shut those doors. And you don't have the opportunity to be the church that you should be. So he holds, God, Jesus holds the keys to the door of opportunity. He shuts the doors of opportunity. He may give you an opportunity, and you may say, no, I'm not going to do that. And so I'll shut the door. That's right. That's right. But having said all this, uh, I want to reiterate I was actually, me and Kenny were at a prayer meeting today, and I said it, you know, this is a great church from what I can tell. This is full of great people that really love the Lord. We're not perfect, but it's a church that really loves the Lord and as a whole really wants to serve the Lord. I personally think we have a lot to feel good about. I don't want to use the word pride, but I, I personally think that we have a lot to feel good about, and I hope you do too. But it's, we can never rest on our laurels. We need to keep working. And if the Lord does reveal something we need to change, we need to change. We need to say we need to take a look at ourselves and constantly evaluate, do that spiritual audit as a body of believers. Because at the end of the day, it's not as important what I think is important what he thinks. Right? Well, pull out your prayer list. Don't y'all 
I think y'all agree with me. You know, I'd like to think you do. We have, God has been working. We are, we're a praying church, and uh, when we put that call multiplier out and we got a prayer, you know, request going 